us an order, huh? Yes, I do. <laughs> Wise. Well, good morning, and if I could uh, welcome everyone to the National Press Club. Um, my name's Frank Salufo. I have the privilege of hosting today's event uh, with um, six former Senate-confirmed Deputy Secretaries of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it's uh, pretty awesome. Uh, you've got the, the, the did, brain did power. Did you interrupt that applause? <laughs> <laughs> Please go. <laughs> <laughs> no, in all sincerity, uh, it's not every day you get to hear from uh, so many leaders who, who've seen uh, from the very top everything that the department uh, is engaging with every day. In fact, it's not every day. I think this is the very first day that we've assembled this group today that spans the history of the department uh, across all administrations. and. Um, uh, and presidents, and, and, and one of the things I hope we speak to today is to get a sense of both the breadth, the depth, the scale, and the scope of the department's mission, which changes over time and is recalibrated over time, but at the end of the day, they uh, oversee the women and men uh, who work tirelessly day in, day out to keep our country secure. Um, before I introduce the panelists, though, since uh, tomorrow is the 18th uh, anniversary, of 9-11 uh, and the attacks on our country that led to the department. Uh, if I could ask you all to bow your heads for a, a few seconds in memory of the, the victims. Thank you. And uh, I think we'll also have an opportunity to celebrate the hard work of the women and men who've uh, kept this country secure. So I will very briefly introduce everyone. Uh, and as you see, they're in chronological order. Uh, uh, first, um, <laughs> we've got Admiral Jim Loy. Uh, Admiral Loy came to, to the, the Department of Homeland Security at its very genesis, uh, served as Deputy Secretary, previously served as Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, one of the component agencies, one of the 22 that made up the department, and was also in a critical role uh, for transportation security at TSA uh, just prior to becoming Deputy Secretary. Next, we have uh, Deputy Secretary Michael Jackson, uh, also served in the Bush administration, uh, came to uh, DHS in the deputy role as the former Deputy Secretary at Transportation. Uh, and quite honestly, on the day of 9-11, I want him to take us back to that day because uh, security became his biggest priority and uh, obviously the country's uh, biggest priority. Next, we have Paul Schneider, uh, who is also serving as uh, Deputy Secretary under uh, Secretary Chertoff. Um, and, and Paul came to the department with a wealth of uh, background and, and, and expertise from the Department of Defense, NASA, and the National Security Agency, where he ran uh, acquisition programs. Uh, then we've got Jane Lute, uh, who served as Deputy Secretary uh, under uh, Janet Napolitano. And uh, uh, Secretary Lute uh, brought a whole host, not only military background, um, but also had served in uh, so many senior positions and continues to serve in senior positions at the United Nations. and. Uh, uh, you'll see that the genesis of uh, the Department of Homeland Security did touch a number of international elements. Uh, then we have uh, Ali Mayorkas, uh, who also served as Deputy Secretary um, under the Obama administration and uh, came to the job um, in, in with, with a breadth of background, knowledge, expertise, but also served as U.S. Attorney in California and brought that prosecutorial mindset to, to the department. And last, but uh, certainly not least, we have Elaine Duke, who grew up in, in some way uh, or another within the department's various mission. Prior to being deputy secretary, she served as undersecretary for management, uh, which I think is one of the most complex, interesting, uh, uh, and, and overarching jobs within the department. And I might note that, Paul, you two were uh, in that undersecretary of management job. So we, we've got literally the, uh, the, uh, the titans of uh, the uh, department here. 
um, that have really important insights historically. You know, we have not kept an oral history of the department, so I hope part of what we're doing there is trying to build that knowledge base uh, for future generations going forward. What I thought I'd do is with the very first question, tee it up, um, and this is a little bit of story in that oral history sort of mindset. What was, what was it like day one when you came into that deputy secretary role? What kept you up at night? What were the priorities? And uh, uh, if we can start with you, Admiral Loy. So we have about four hours. <laughs> <laughs> the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Frank, thanks very much, and thanks for gathering uh, this August panel. Uh, dear, dear friends uh, who we have all s sort of s stuck together in the good times and bad times over the, dur the duration of those 18 years. Uh, I think on the beginning, uh, it was the classic startup organization. Uh, beyond the uh, variety of ideas that uh, composed the um, inputs to what became the Homeland Security Act of 2002, uh, it was actually the second major piece of legislation that had something to do with the genesis of the department in the aftermath of 9-11, the first one being the Aviation Transportation Security Act. Um, and Michael and I both were deeply involved as partners in the creation and stand-up of uh, TSA and in the genesis of both those pieces of legislation. Uh, I would count, I would, I have always counted and said this publicly many times that I thought the Aviation Transportation Security Act was one of the best pieces of legislation uh, that the Congress ever passed because it was very discreet, it was very straightforward, there were 36 absolute things that we had to get done with, with discreet timelines associated with each one. Uh, and I can remember vividly the press accounts that said, uh, as we got number 11 accomplished the night before, no way these, the, no way these clowns are going to get number 13 or 14 done. But we hit them all. We hit all those deadlines on time in the stand-up process of, uh, of, uh, of TSA. That was all about because that's what happened to our country. We were the victims of a commercial aviation tragedy. Uh, and you'll find the same kind of expertise in London about subway systems and in Spain about train accidents because that's what happened to them as, uh, as countries. But in the stand-up of DHS then, uh, the challenge of the Homeland Security Act of 2002 uh, did include some confusion along the way. There were various versions of what ought to be the legislation inside the executive branch. And we were watching on Capitol Hill as virtually every committee known to man was creating what they thought would be the Homeland Security Act uh, uh, primo uh, for, for that window of time in late 2001. <clears throat> Once the act was passed, even then there was a challenge associated with trying to figure out what our mission profile really needed to be and the priorities within that mission profile. Uh, I remember vividly uh, with Governor Ridge, then Secretary Ridge, uh, taking a group of about 60 people from all of these 22 agencies or pieces of agencies that were coming in our direction. And we went to an offsite and sat down trying to figure out uh, what was the mission of this new department and how were we going to go about the business of, of, uh, of pulling it off. And I remember five magic words that came out of that. And interestingly, those five magic words are now in a plaque outside the Secretary's office on, up, up, uh, at, at DHS headquarters. And the five magic words were awareness, prevention, protection, response, and recovery. And there was sort of a God forbid event, if you will, between the notions of preventing and protecting things and responding and recovering from things. And uh, one of the phrases that, uh, that Michael was uh, kind enough to roll onto our table in the TSA stand-up process was buckets of work. He would assign us a variety of different buckets of work to get accomplished as we put the puzzle pieces together in the stand-up process for TSA. And so as we were at that offsite, uh, Governor Ridge was uh, focused on the idea to the players in the audience, and the players in the audience were these 22 agencies coming in our direction. If you do not see your work as you understand it in one or more of those five magic buckets of work, then we're going to stay here until you do. Uh, but those five words became the uh, license, if you will, for all of us to continue doing what we were doing and begin the process of trying to do other things collaboratively 
that had never been done perhaps by this particular gathering of, uh, of U.S. players. So the, the two things that I would uh, roll onto the table as being the most consequential from that very beginning steps were the uh, APPRR, Awareness, Prevention, Protection, Response, and Recovery, that that was, in fact, the scope of work that the country was expecting those of us who were being pulled into this organization called the Department of Homeland Security would get accomplished for our, for our country. A brand new organization had to deal with the relationship building process that included committee structures on Capitol Hill, bridges to the White House for policy guidance when that was appropriate, reach to our collaborators in the other executive branch uh, uh, elements of the executive branch of government, uh, and then getting on with populating this new, uh, this, new bureauc you know, this new bureaucracy. And so working with the White House staff and the, and the HR end of the White House in terms of finding the right players uh, to put together the department staff, uh, because in the meantime, we were relatively totally dependent, and that was perfectly okay, on the modal administrators, the Commandant of the Coast Guard, the Commissioner of the Customs Service, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to get on with what they routinely do, but to be doing that in the face of these five magic words, if you will, that came out of, uh, of our time together at that offsite. The other critical thing that I don't want to leave uh, without putting on the table initially here is the, is the notion of the reach to the private sector. And I often believe that still is a bit of a challenge for the new Department of Homeland Security. We say new, although it's 18 years old now. Uh, but the, the notion of recognizing and seeing where uh, the, the leading edge of technology, the leading edge of how to get something done may very well reside in the public sector and actually most likely does. So how you find the bridge to go get that expertise and those ideas uh, into the government, governmental end of the department uh, is the other, in my mind, absolutely critical thing. When we were standing up TSA, uh, Michael, I'm sure, would remember that had it not been for the Accentures of the world, the Lockheed Martins of the world, the, the Disneys of the world, the FedExes of the world, if it wasn't for those guys who seconded to us players that we work with over the course of the stand-up process of TSA, we'd probably still be on, you know, maybe number 18 on that list of 36 things that we were supposed to have gotten done on that calendar. Uh, so my thoughts, uh, Frank, no, to, to awesome. at least start this is a beginning startup has all the earmarks in government of any kind of a startup in business or any other business. Uh, the, all those functional uh, activities had to be dealt with. But the two things that I would ask you to hold on to from the beginning was this notion of these five buckets of work that began to begin, or that began to describe the scope of what the uh, department's mission was to be for our country. And then secondly, this, uh, this very simple idea of recognizing how extraordinary in the private sector lie lots of different things that have great, uh, have the potential to have great impact and, uh, and bring ideas to the forefront. Thank you, Jamie. You raised a number of uh, amazing points, and I'm reminded of one of my favorite quotes of Mark Twain, where his history may not repeat itself, it tends to rhyme. <laughs> we're seeing, we're hearing a whole lot of rhyming going on, whether it's how Hill oversight, whether it's private sector engagement, notably vis-a-vis -vis cybersecurity, uh, the five tenants, and, and you know, my mom taught me two magic words, and they were thank you, so thank you for what you did uh, <laughs> during those years. Um, Michael, now, uh, sort of when, when you came in, obviously it was at a, at a different time in history, too. We have to realize the threat level was running pretty high. I, I had the privilege of looking at these uh, issues from the White House perch at that time, but what, what were your primary kinds of uh, considerations, and, um, and, and most importantly, what did you see your role coming right into the job, and, and I would like you to set, step back a little bit given your transportation role. You came in with really unique insights there. Well, uh, following Jim is always a challenge, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> he's, the he's, rock star. he's right um, in everything he said. And I will back up a little bit to 9-11, uh, 
which is, uh, which is uh, the foundation of what happened to make us have to Sorry. build this DHS. And, and in the first phases after 9-11, uh, really the, what became DHS was trying to talk to each other across the government <laughs> In, in a nascent way and to try to understand the risk, the vulnerability and consequences of what we found in a post 9-11 world. And uh, so I'll go to a little a few months before 9-11 um, happened. The president uh, uh, brought all of his uh, deputy secretaries to uh, the White House and sat in the Roosevelt room. He says, I want to talk about what deputy secretaries are supposed to be doing. And uh, he said, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. You're the chief operating officers of our departments. The secretaries, they got a lot of work on, on their plate. But you have to focus on making the machine work and understanding with peripheral vision all of the, all of the threats and the vulnerabilities that you have and where you can go and where you can't go and how to get things done. And he said, uh, I, I want to give you a, uh, a, a rare sort of piece of advice which I don't want you ever to break. And that is if, if any one of the, look at the women and men in this room and, and if any one of them ever calls you and says, I need some help with this problem, you drop what you're doing and you go help that person. And um, so I would say the, the first part about the period between 9-11 after we'd gone to the Hill, and that, that was, that was uh, an assignment I got with a White House uh, colleague to go up and, and negotiate that bill. Uh, we, we really called upon the whole of the government as best we could, and it wasn't architecturally structured and legally structured to throw all the assets into one bucket and have one person have, have the control of it. But there was a, an enormous amount of cooperation and collegiality. Uh, we, we, there are a few of us that had worked in Bush 41's administration and knew that the deputies had a little um, uh, idea of introducing themselves and their spouses to each other and going to dinner every, you know, maybe once a quarter or twice a year or something like that. So we had, uh, after the COO lecture from the president, decided we were going to do that. And it turned out that we scheduled it for, I think, four days after 9-11. And uh, well, I say this because uh, what we did was we, we called upon each other to, to make the things happen and, uh, and, to, and to borrow assets. At DOT, we were the most needy place in the whole U.S. government. And uh, for example, to get planes back up in the air, we had to have uh, some, you know, faux air marshals uh, uh, in, in the cockpits. I mean, outside the door of the cockpits. We borrowed everybody with, with a gun in the, in the U.S. government. I mean, there were, the, I mean you, you can't think of an agency that didn't say, said, yeah, we'll send you. You said borrowed? <laughs> Stolen. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I made one of those calls that the president said I could make, and so I just said, "Hey, I need your help. We're, you know, we're flat on our backs," and that's how we got the airplanes up after a few days. And um, uh, so, so anyway, there was this period at, at DOT and, and also in the White House, uh, and, uh, and a lot of people in this room know, know these stories, but. Th there was a sort of practicing of how to get all of the all of the things that related to homeland security coordinated in some way, whether it was DOD marching in their own uh, space, or uh, uh, Treasury, or, or, or you name it, the intelligence community. So that was a big learn. That was the first learning step. And the president, after after the attack, uh, basically had a daily. Uh, cattle call with cabinet members and some some deputies that were that were in the line of fire. I was um, blessed to be in that, that little crowd, and, and then when it finally got stabilized enough so that the, the the groups could work together and through the White House Policy Council uh, that was there, he he stopped having that. But in the end, it was the natural thing to do to, to build uh, a department that could take this on in, in, the, full, in the full breadth of, uh, of every day. And, uh, and so 
Uh, what, what were we worried about when, uh, when Jim uh, got the green light so that he could, he could leave? Uh, well, we were worried about everything. Uh, <laughs> the the, we, we had at DOT done a little um, exercise. Uh, we, we did recruit uh, a dozen loaned executives from some of the most impressive uh, people that I've ever worked with from, from the private sector to help us get TSA stood up. And we, we basically ended up with something like 50 buckets of problems. And we collected career people, this is hugely important, and political people and outside uh, private sector people to work on these problems. You know, some of them were foolishly simple, like, you know, we're going to hire a bunch of people to be TSA uh, uh, presence in the airports and they're going to have to wear a uniform, go figure out the uniform. You know, so like that, that was like, fine, I don't care really, you know, you just come back and tell me when it's done. Uh, but there were more complex and truly, truly difficult uh, problems about the security structures that we were going to build and how they were going to work together and, and how, how we were going to work with other departments. So when I, when I showed up with Jim and after talking, uh, Jim, was, Jim was on his way out after doing a phenomenal job and, uh, you know, we, we created that same process over again we called the second stage review. Like, the, like when you launch a rocket, it's lifted off and uh, you ignite this second stage and it, and it does a course correction and takes you, takes you on. Uh, Tom Ridge and his team had done a phenomenal job of getting, getting the rocket launched and it was headed in the right direction. And, and so we, we put together again another 30 or five or so, 40, 40 or so uh, working groups to say, Here's our worry list, and how are we going to tackle the problems that are on that worry list? And that was very, that was very, uh, you know, uh, organized and, and thoughtful, and that helped Mike Chertoff decide, okay, here's what I need to focus on, and here's what the department needs to focus on. Here's what's broken, and that we this, that we still can fix. And so, that was sort of a, the start. And the answer was, you, you know, the problem set. It was everything. It was still in the, in the mode that people, you know, today I talked to my 24-year-old daughter and she, she has trouble sort of imagining what that was really like when you saw uh, disaster behind every, every tree. Uh, every, every piece of the, the uh, country's infrastructure, every, every function, every departmental, uh, you, you know, dependency, we, we saw that as uh, a vulnerability that we had to tighten and screw down and to make sure that we could coordinate uh, skill sets, we could uh, make it harder to do things. So, you know, I'll just take one example uh, the, uh, that it's, that's been later talked about more, so the, the power grid, you, you know, we brought all the CEOs of the uh, of the uh, electric industry together, and uh, none of them, you know, had a security clearance. So we we rolled them all through a security clearance process, and uh, and then we scared the bejeebies out of them by <laughs> by saying, "Here's what we're worried about and why, and here's what we think you guys have to do now or like tomorrow it has to be done." And and they they joined us with that. So it was our people. Uh, the, the private sector, as Jim, Jim said, it was also our foreign partners. Uh, really, it was, a, it was a sort of magical period of, of cooperation, especially with the Five Eyes countries. But, I mean, I, I remember going up to <clears throat> Canada after 9-11 <clears throat> after a little bit to work on uh, the, get, getting all the doors replaced on every airplane that flew in the sky. And, um, which we did faster than anybody else in the world. And then we said, if you want to fly a plane uh, to or over our airspace, you, you just got to fix your doors. And uh, you know, if you want to take longer than we are, that's fine. But you can't come with air, one of your airplanes here until your doors have been replaced. But but uh, we we had I remember with a bilateral with the Chinese government saying, tell me how we can help you do these things. So there was a there was sort of a global uh, governmental moment to, to try to help avoid terrorism. Same. And and that's a that's sort of the 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 moving parts of the, the arrival at DHS for me. Thank you, Michael. And there were a ton of themes I want to pull on, including integration. And I think 
arguably most importantly, that Homeland Security, the broader enterprise, is much more than the Department of Homeland Security. It's state, local, territorial, tribal, it's private sector, um, and, and I want to make sure we, and of course international, and I want to make sure we pull on that thread. But fair to say, building that airplane mid-flight, getting it uh, on a course, the 2SR was uh, bringing a risk-based approach to the department or trying to get our arms around an endless number of threats, uh, endless vulnerabilities, limited resources, and how we can start uh, uh, battening that down. And then, Paul, you 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 came in uh, immediately following uh, Michael, and I, I'd be curious what, what kept you up at night, and uh, what did you do differently, if anything, than uh, your predecessor? Well, well, first, because I was the undersecretary for management, I had the opportunity to learn about the department uh, under uh, Michael. And because of the nature of the job, while I was not involved in the uh, actually operational law enforcement aspect, I got heavily involved because Michael dragged me in in a lot of the uh, relationships internationally between Canada, the UK, uh, and, uh, and Mexico, as well as uh, a lot of the things we did covered all of the operational components. So I had a significant leg up when I became the Deputy Secretary, A, because I knew the headquarters, but more importantly, I knew all the operational components. One of the things Michael did was uh, every week get all the heads of the operational components together to start working together on common issues and things like that. I frequently attended those meetings. So I was a known quantity to the heads of the operational components, which made it basically a little easier since, say, the first day I walked in as the Under Secretary for Management, where the only two people I knew were Michael and Elaine Duke. So, uh, uh, company. Huh? yeah. Who you stole from TSA? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so uh, in a lot of ways, uh, a lot of the uh, structure that had been put in place by by Michael uh, and and the secretary, we we just worked with it. He he fixed, frankly, a lot of some of the bureaucracy bureaucracy issues that made streamlined it quite a bit. So my, my job was really on uh, heavily uh, focused on a couple of pieces. One, the operations, kind of improve on, on what's been set up. And when I say that is uh, in about seven months, we were hit with one major disaster after another. And, uh, you know, uh, Michael suffered through Katrina. I had, uh, frankly, worried about one disaster after another in, in New Orleans in Texas, uh, uh, ice storms, floods, and then we had the massive wildfires out in California. Seems like that happens every couple of year, year, year or so. So what we did was really kind of, yeah, yeah. So what we did was really improve on how we basically uh, operate between uh, the secretary with a flyaway team, uh, with uh, the deputy in FEMA and myself coordinating the federal response. And we had a little bit of extra help because you can imagine the president uh, was uh, very sensitive to these types of issues after Katrina. So while I would be at the uh, control center at FEMA, you know, we'd have everybody on the VTC and then you see the president from the White House waving to everybody or sometimes coming over. So the coordination, uh, I think we helped kind of refine that and carry that uh, a step further. Uh, uh, cyber. The whole cyber initiative started to come together in Michael, the end of Michael's uh, time and really became full-blown when I was there. This was when the president decided we've got to do something about cyber, and that's because the, uh, the director, of Naval, uh, director of National Intelligence, a former uh, Intel Navy three-star, convinced him of such, and he was, he, he was right to do that. Uh, the problem was, how do we execute? And so when the president signed the executive order, the president said to, to uh, Secretary Chertoff, Mike, you, you've got this. So I'm walking out of the steps of uh, the White House with the secretary, and I said, how are we going to do this? You know, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, th th that's not exactly, uh, DHS is not exactly a home for people with uh, that type of capability. So we really had to work hard on getting that thing uh, 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 set up, and, and it's very difficult in its formative stage because that's where you nearly need the coordination across the entire federal government. And I guess, uh, you know, Frank, you're going to talk about that later, but that was absolutely instrumental 
to making sure you could get something done. The other thing I worried about uh, a lot was the intelligence. And so uh, anybody that has you know, read the 9-11 report knows that the, uh, uh, one of the big failures was the uh, ability to connect the dots. And, uh, and so uh, one of the things that the Secretary Trevor and Michael did was, I don't know how he got there, but they uh, hired to be the Undersecretary for Intelligence a, a, a fellow who came from the intelligence community who the Washington Post had frequently referred to as a legend in his time. And so if and you- still is. And still is. Charlie and is. He's my former business <clears throat> partner, actually. And so if you think about this for a second, uh, you have a pretty closed intel community, and here you had a situation, 9-11 report, that said, well, they weren't exactly working together as well as could be, so something has to be done. So if you think about that, how do you take an upstart agency like DHS and insert themselves with credibility and get a seat at the table? Well, my opinion, the best way to do that is you get the legend in his own time who has absolutely fearless <clears throat> about busting in and talking to the head of the CIA, the DNI, et cetera. My view is he legitimatized the ability or the recognition of DHS as a key partner in Intel. And he, and he said no two times to me before he called back and said, my wife says I should do this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, he is a true patriot. He wanted to do it. He wanted to do it. Uh, he, he's a true patriot. So you have to think about this for a second uh, because he had instant credibility with the heads of all those agencies. I was very fortunate because I had known the DNI for about 30 some odd years. The, uh, the head of the CIA was my former boss at uh, uh, NSA. Uh, and on the DOD side, the DEPSEC I used to work for, and the Assistant Secretary of Defense for three, C3I happened to be my, my buddy. So the head of NSA happened to be the one star that I worked with when I was there. So we, I think, carried the ball a little further on basically cementing the importance of uh, Intel to DHS. The other thing we did was... Okay, can, I, can I just stop? We'll, we should come back and talk about career versus uh, uh, pl political. But what, Absolutely. What you just heard out of, uh, of my friend's mouth here is that he brought a lifetime of career civil service and military uh, service to, and relationships. to our department. And relationships. And, relationships. and he understood how to synthesize that with, with all the things that we had to face that were new. Yeah. The other thing I think, uh, one of the things I knew when I walked in the job was I had a defined period of time to work. And that's because it was gonna, the administration was going to end. So that brought with it a whole other set of challenges that uh, one usually doesn't have. Uh, number one, how do you transition how do you transition a department that didn't exist when literally the heads of every one of the agency agencies and about 25 or 30 political appointees are going to walk out the door on January 20th? Not a simple thing to do. And uh, and so I was very fortunate because. Uh, my response to that was, hey, I'm just going to give that to the Under Secretary of Management. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so uh, we, we, the department spent a tremendous amount of time on this. I had to spend a lot of time on this myself because the Congress was interested in, well, how are you going to transition? Well, without getting into the details of bad-mouthing the Congress, they were not very helpful. We had some very contentious hearings. And uh, uh, where that would not have happened with another department. So you have to keep in mind, at the same time, hurricanes, fires, floods, intel, a lot of these other things, you got to worry about the transition of the administration. The other thing that, frankly, I, I personally worried about, and frankly, so did Secretary Chernoff, was the uh, special security event called the inauguration. <laughs> And uh, so there's been lots of special security events. The department had worked with special security events, uh, whether it's uh, uh, party committee uh, you know, uh, conventions. Uh, conventions or whether it's a, a Super Bowl, Super Bowl. stuff like that. But when you're right in the heart of Olympics. D.C. 
and you're going to have all kinds of, uh, of issues, uh, you need to worry about that. So I can tell you that he and I both worried about that in great detail. I can tell you that three months before that, I was down counting buses and where they were going to park, okay, because because that's the kind of detail you got to get involved with in this thing. So I, I think the bottom line was I picked, carried the ball a step further, tried to refine and embellish a lot of the processes that uh, Michael had been put in place. But the one bit of guidance that he gave me uh, before he left was really pretty simple. That is, don't forget, you are the chief operating officer of this department, okay? And the fact that I had the opportunity to watch and observe how he executed that was a benefit that uh, just there's no way to uh, emphasize how valuable that was being able to go do that job. Thank you, Paul. And, and, and you underscored transition and uh, Deputy, Deputy Secretary Lou Jane, you were the first Deputy Secretary in a transition for the department. So take us back if you can. And uh, what, what rubbed you is if there were any recalibration, any changes, and, and what you thought the, the mission of the Deputy Secretary was. So this will, uh, uh, this will be an exercise for all of you in, in the truth that every letter has a bottom rung. And so that's the role oh, that I'm playing on this, uh, on this oh, panel. Um, I came into the department, apparently I'm the longest serving deputy, but I came into the department uh, when the department was between five and six years old. Um, and that was really good news. It was not one year old for the sixth time. <laughs> and the reason it was not was because of what you just heard. Um, what does a chief operating officer do? Chief operating officer doesn't run everything, anything. Your job is to see that everything is running. And there's a difference, and you hmm. need to understand that. And the other thing I learned when I, when I got to the department is that most everything anyone knows about Homeland Security is wrong. Because most people compare it to national security. Most people come out of the DOD world or the intelligence world or the national security world. In fact, I had myself. I spent 32 years in national and international security. Um, and I got to Homeland Security, and it was a whole different cat to me. And I found out that everything I thought I knew about the role of the federal government in dealing with security was wrong. And the, there are big differences between national security and homeland security. And what you saw in the work of my predecessors was to establish a department that was true to its mandate. In national security, Washington, the president, is the national command authority. In homeland security, Washington is the federal partner to the state and local governments. It is a different role. Yep. Your relationship between the, between the public, government, and fear is very different. There are a lot of pathologies that exist in the national security world, and, and particularly in the intelligence world. Paul talked about it a little bit, so did, so did uh, Michael and Jim. One of the pathologies in the intelligence world is that, you know, the harder a piece of information is to get, the more valuable it must be. Well, we actually found out that streetcar vendors in <laughs> Times Square, New York, have pretty valuable information if we just listen. Oh, yeah. National security is strategic, it's centralized, and it's top-driven. Homeland security is transactional, decentralized, and bottom driven. When Paul mentioned cybersecurity and so the whole cyber world, can you think of three less useful words in the English language to describe the internet and today's life online than strategic, centralized, and top driven? <laughs> I can. Useless words, useless approach in my view to security. Not because we don't need assets that are organized strategically, that are centralized, that are top-driven. We do. And frankly, we have some of the best in the world. But if we're approaching security in the homeland sense as a partner to others, how should we play that role? So when I came into the department, the department was established. People thought it was going to be abolished under the Obama administration. Um, you know, in fact, plans were being made to abolish this department. Why did we create this to begin with? Are memories really that short? <laughs> but there, it's, it's, it's kind of unthinkable now, right? And so the first, one of the first tasks that we had um, was, to, was to sort of narrate uh, something that was called the QHSR, the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, which was modeled on the Defense Department's QDR, Quadrennial Defense Review. Um, by the way, ours was the first, but they didn't want to call it the F. HSR or whatever. I mean, so, so we were quite <laughs> Yeah, so we were Q when we had no, you know, oh. Anyway, um, and so what we had to narrate, why do we pay for this department? 
You know, and I remember talking to the head of the Coast Guard at the time when I, we were writing this, and this was one of my first responsibilities. I said, you know, I don't know, why do we, why do we pay for the Coast Guard? And he looked at me like I was a lunatic. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, well, deputy, we have 11 statutory missions. I said, I'm not writing that down. We pay for the Coast Guard because we need an organization to ensure the safe, safety, security, and stewardship of the nation's waters. I mean, it took us three months, that sentence. <laughs> but it tells you in a sentence that the Coast Guard is not a low-end Navy, and that it has a novel contribution to make to the security and the resilience of this country. Why do we have the Department of Homeland Security? Our not-so-very poetic answer was to help create a safe, secure, resilient place where the American way of life can thrive. Help, right? We're a federal partner in that. And so how do we approach those? You know, our mission number one is pre was to prevent another 9-11. And I remember having conversations. Again, I came out of this world, the national security world. I came out of this world and having conversations with our intelligence colleagues and our relationships were very good. They took us very seriously. So what's your theory of the case about terrorism in this country and the likelihood of another 9-11 attack? And I said, okay, look, let me tell you what I think, I think your theory of the case is. The bad guys are out there trying to come here. You know, and so we have to, how do we deal with that? We have to find them and fix them, in a military sense, keep them abroad. So we've got bad guys out there trying to come here. And our job is to find them where they are and keep them where they are, keep them far away from us. What tools do we have? We have an enormous intelligence capability. We have our military that was deployed um, actively still, uh, you know, at that time. And we have our allies and partnerships around the world, right? So I had a question. What if they're here? What if they're already here? And this is the difference between national security and homeland security. It's an and exercise. You know, national security information is shared on the basis of need to know. Our, our job is duty to share, mm -hmm. right? You know, they organize and execute operations on the national security side with unity of command, right? We do unity of effort. It's a different model, it's a different approach. Um, uh, Paul and, and Michael and Jim also mentioned the importance of the private sector. Unbelievably important. We have an ability to work with the private sector. We have an ability to have a conversation with the private sector um, on behalf of the, um, figuring out what should the role of government be. When we think about the problem of cybersecurity, I don't do anything that's hard. <laughs> you know, Jim had five, five um, magic words, and they are magic words, and they mean a lot. Um, but when I think about cybersecurity, you know, it, I boiled it down to sort of three questions that we were trying to understand. How do we architect systems we can trust from components we can't? How do we safeguard the integrity of our information and our identity in an open internet? And what should the role of government be? Those were the three questions. And, and you know, the problem of security in cyberspace was really a challenge for the federal government. It's a challenge for any government. Why? Because governments are used to having the assignment of security. And that's what you saw building up in the Department of Homeland Security. We want safe streets. Governments, you run the police. We want a safe country. Government, you make the laws. You run the military. And so governments are used to not only having the assignment of security, they're used to being the monopolists in security, except in cyberspace. They don't have that assignment. They don't have that role. So we've been trying to figure that out. And it was, as Paul said, it began uh, with them. And it was, it was really instantiated and, and institutionalized to a large extent. We continued that work. So one of the themes that you will see here is the continuity and accumulation of work moving forward. The department at its outset, because of it, 22 agencies coming together, was unauditable. We achieved a clean audit opinion, and we've sustained that. OK, does that matter? It certainly matters. You'd like to know where the money's going. DOD, call your office. <laughs> so, so the point is, is that as, as the, you know, we can talk about the security of the American homeland, what people in homeland security do, they have a theory of the case. They can talk to you about how they approach it, how we relate to fear, you know, prevention, awareness, prevention, protection. Those all matter. They operationalize. And this, I, I'll conclude with this point. Homeland security is an operating agency. It's an operating agency. Washington really does not understand operating agencies. It understands policy agencies and it understands regulatory agencies, but it really doesn't, in its bones, understand 
operating agencies. I remember um, having a conversation about the 108 committees and subcommittees in Congress to which the Department of Homeland Security reports. You know, we have 535 people who think they're experts in Homeland Security because they are. Because they are. And so this department really, if you think of it as the federal partner in a complex security challenge, it's different than national security. And I think that's, the difference is a good one. Well, thank you, Jane. And you brought up a <clears throat> bunch of points I hope we can uh, um, get into. Notably, the homeland security meet national security meet our nation's security. Um, yeah, it, one is the art of persuasion, the other is the science of command and control, and, and, and I think that is a huge differentiator when we look at the roles, missions, and, uh, uh, and authorities. But I, I also really appreciated your front lines are not only coming out of government, and, and I think that's something we all sometimes need a reminder. It was a vigilant passenger that was able to tackle our so-called booty bomber, our underwear bomber, Abdul Muttalib, uh, a number of years ago. And again, that's uh, in addition to the baselines rising from the government, I think society as a whole and, 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 and awareness uh, uh, is greater. See, see, so, something, say something. see something, say something. Uh, Alejandro, when you came in, uh, obviously you had the, the, the privilege of succeeding um, uh, Deputy Secretary Lute. What, what were your thoughts coming in? And you come at, at it maybe from a little bit of a different perspective than everyone else here, having served uh, as a U.S. attorney, um, seeing it from uh, that perch as well. Uh, what were your priorities day one? Well, let me, if I can, Frank, uh, first of all say thank you and, and echo um, a truth and a sentiment that <laughs> Um, Secretary Lute articulated, which is, I mean, to some extent, my job was much easier than uh, that of any of my predecessors because I was actually able to build on the work of all of my predecessors. Um, and I had the opportunity to consult with them as I was just beginning uh, my service as a Deputy Secretary, having come from within the department as the Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. I didn't have uh, as much experience within the department as, as um, uh, Deputy Secretary Schneider, but I had the benefit of a memorandum that Deputy Secretary Schneider uh, drafted for me with his thoughts. You may not remember that, but I kept it on my desk throughout my, my <laughs> tenure. It was extraordinarily helpful. It's amazing uh, as much as things change, they say they stay the same because I will tell you, when one asked me what did I worry about, I worried about everything. <laughs> um, and I remember advice that I was given by Robert Bonner, who was in 1989 the United States Attorney in Los Angeles in the Central District of California and who hired me as a young federal prosecutor who later became ultimately the Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection. He said, Ali, make sure you keep a post-it on your phone with your three to five priorities and keep your eye on those three to five priorities. And by the way, if you have five, you probably have too many. Mm -hmm. But keep your eye on them because the day-to-day -day barrage of what will come at you can <coughs> swallow um, your entire tenure. And I will tell you, I experienced that challenge all the time. One looks back at uh, the four years I can think of so many developments that could have sidetracked me for too long a time, and they did sidetrack me in terms of my focus on priorities for some period of time, and I made it made sure it was finite because of that post-it on my phone. An individual jumps over the fence around the White House, manages to get in the front, front doors, and not only do we have to conduct an investigation, and I was tasked with leading that investigation, <laughs> but we have a tremendous amount uh, of oversight, congressional oversight uh, on that. We have more than 80 uh, five committees overseeing the Department of Homeland Security, so oversight can come from many different perspectives. And so I would describe my tenure as defense against bombardment uh, <laughs> of issues <laughs> Uh, but most of all, of course, a privilege to work with so many uh, incredible people. I think today the important thing to remember, because uh, regrettably, 
uh, almost one issue is dominating the public's understanding of the Department of Homeland Security, but the extraordinary breadth and wingspan of the department. When, when I started, um, we were working on the Arctic strategy. We were countering violent extremism. Uh, Secretary Lute made the important point, uh, of course, we have to prevent and protect from people uh, who want to do us harm from coming in, but what if they're already here? During uh, the four years of the Obama administration, which I served, we had a shift in the ISIS strategy, uh, uh, and we had a, an issue of the radicalization of individuals here, and that implicated the internet. It implicated such issues uh, uh, as encryption. Um, uh, Homeland Security grants to cities, the empowerment of fusion centers, the issue of partnership, um, the, 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 the myriad of issues that really can consume the Deputy Secretary from both a policy making and an operational perspective, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's an extraordinary uh, expanse. Um, we placed, uh, Secretary Johnson and I placed those myriad of issues under the umbrella, as Secretary Lute mentioned, of unity of effort. Unity of effort internally within the department to make sure that the different agencies, the 22 agencies and offices within the department are working in an integrated fashion when their uh, work can overlap to make sure that we are not conflicting but we're working in a complementary manner <coughs> to make sure that we are united with our critical partners, our state, local law enforcement, first responder community, uh, unity of effort uh, with pri the private sector, where quite frankly, I think it was alluded to earlier, we still have a tremendous amount of work to do. We have an Office uh, of Science <coughs> and Technology. We conduct a tremendous amount of research internally. Is our research and is the direction in which we're headed actually aligned with the research and direction uh, of the private sector um, uh, with which we must work in complementary fashion? Um, and so unity of effort internally, externally, internationally, within the interagency, um, uh, the department has its footprint in so many different areas and we just have to make sure that that footprint is well defined, and once it is well defined, that it's actually burnished. I think that was the greatest challenge. Marcus, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, last, but again, certainly not least, uh, uh, Secretary Duke, um, you also came in in a transition, but had the the benefit of growing up, the departments growing up. Um, and I'd be curious what your priorities were day one, what you thought the mission was day one, and and again having understood the department through the undersecretary and management role, I think put you in a very unique position. But well, thank you, and uh, I appreciate the 3,472 years of experience I have here to my <laughs> left. <laughs> and add mine in and you go over 4,000. Um, so, uh, yeah, I had a seven-year break um, between my role as undersecretary for management and being asked to come back to be the chief operating officer of DHS. Um, in 2017. And what I uh, first looked at was, um, I think the number one thing was why are we there? And there's a tradition among deputies that I think is very important for those sitting here on the table. There's a picture from 9-11 that sits in the deputy's office wall. And when a new deputy secretary is confirmed, the prior deputy secretary comes in, then signs it and passes it. And I think that's an important Pretty tradition. Awesome. And I think it's our unifying effort. And I think in, in today's times, one of the, the things- are on the back side. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Look on the, desk, look on the back side. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one, one of the, the, the challenges is, is that a lot of the role as a COO is not a political effort. It may be politicized in the media and to some people's minds, but the basic Homeland Security mission has transitioned in a very stable approach all the way down the table um, through the signatures on the back of that picture and also through our actions. So when I came back as a COO, I was looking at what is the difference between 
what the Undersecretary of Management does as the statutory chief management officer, and what makes the difference between that and the chief operating officer. And what it is, is it's the unification of mission support and mission towards an effective and efficient carrying out of all the DHS missions. And so what I focused on um, in, the sh in the short time I was deputy before before uh, being acting secretary was how do we take that unity of effort and mature it even more? When I came back after a seven year gap, I saw that the components, the operating components had matured, in my opinion, much more than headquarters had matured. Um, it, headquarters had built a lot of great functions, a good policy function, uh, a, a good management function, uh, a good cyber function, but that thread of pulling them across from strategy and plans through resource allocation to operations was the next phase in maturing. And um, some of the things that were set up, like the joint task forces, enabled us or positioned us to start building that operational coordination that I think is the next stage um, that, that uh, DHS is continuing to mature on. Uh, like was talked about before in Homeland Security, it isn't command and control, it's a coordination effort. And what I think we have to do, both as the COO and as headquarters, is enable our operating components to operate most effectively. We have nearly 250,000 amazing men and women in Department of Homeland Security. And as leaders, our job is to help them, help them adapt their missions. The missions are the same set, but they have changed some. For instance, the synthetic opioid crisis that has really changed the way a lot of Customs and Border Protection has to act in terms of some of their customs uh, and, and trade missions. So it's the same mission, but it's an adaptation. And how do we do that policy, that resource allocation to position them to best execute their missions and adapt to the changes in the environment? And, and I think that's, that's how I see um, the role of COO. A lot of people say, why St. E's? Why is DHS moving to St. Elizabeth? Um, this is a little bit of the oral history that Jim wants, but the main reason for St. E's, um, other than it was a federal site already, is to have a national operations center. There is no place for the department up until St. E's to have that coordination of command coordination of mission court execution um, to, to respond to whether to, to, to issues that are under the mission control of DHS. FEMA does have the National Response Coordination Center for natural disasters, but natural disasters was not the reason or the sole reason DHS were created. And I think that St. Elizabeth's and having a National Operations Center really is kind of the figurehead of why DHS was, corrected, uh, was created for that coordination of missions to best respond to threats against our homeland. And, and that is the maturation of DHS that, that I came back for. Awesome, thank you. There, there's so many issues here we can unpack, but the tyranny of time requires I be a bit of a tyrant in some of these. And I wanna make sure we have an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. But one issue that came up by every uh, one on this panel is, is integration and uh, the issue of interagency matters, how the department and as the steward and COO of the department you uh, are able to, to work with uh, the, the many other agencies, whether it's on the national security side, whether it's in Title 50 intelligence side, or whether it's uh, on some of the more uh, domestic oriented uh, uh, agencies that don't think of security every day as part of their mission, but it is. Uh, and, and just a, a personal little vignette, um, you know, I had the privilege of working for President Bush after 9-11, and, and I think the day you saw great integration was when the president demanded a single daily matrix. CIA had their matrix, FBI had theirs, both of which were great, but it wasn't until you had it integrated into one document that you had an appreciation for how one touched the other, or what our gaps were in collection, or what our opportunities were in terms of other agencies that perhaps uh, 
didn't traditionally have a seat at the table. But I'd love to hear the interagency thoughts. But I have one issue in particular I want to tee up. And this is between uh, uh, Paul, uh, and Dep Secretary uh, Schneider, and Secretary Duke, because I think they have different perspectives. And then I want others to chime in. But HSC, NSC. So um, within the White House, how the uh, uh, interagency from the principals down to the deputies and then uh, uh, in terms of advisors to the president on homeland security issues. Paul, you wanna, you wanna take us back to sort of when we had an HSC? And, yeah, and so uh, I, I was very fortunate because there was a HSC, Homeland Security Council, and a National Security Council. And the structure of the uh, Homeland Security Council was uh, things that needed to be coordinated among the agencies usually started at a lower level, worked their way up to uh, an assistant secretary level, and then ultimately the deputies would, would, would meet, and then the deputies would take care of about, I'd say, 95, 97% of the issues, and then there was about 3, 4% that would have to go to the principals. So the interagency coordination is absolutely essential, and the reason for it is, really, is, is pretty clear. First of all, any major policy issue that affects Homeland Security affects everybody, okay? It affects the State Department in terms of external relationships, what we want to do. It affects the Justice Department, even on, on things like who comes in the United States or if you, if you want to try cases and prosecute. I learned a, 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 a term called, was it prosecutor, prosecutorial discretion? which basically is left up to the prosecutors, and if you have a problem with that, you've got to go deal with the Justice Department. Uh, simple things, like some of you remember the issue with trailers uh, in New Orleans, the, uh, what's that uh, chemical that outgasses and stuff like that? Formaldehyde. Yeah, formaldehyde. So, so, so what does the Department of Homeland Security know about construction of trailers? Formaldehyde, nothing. So who do you rely on? Well, you're supposed to rely on HHS and the uh, CDC on the health side, and you're supposed to rely on HUD for requirements and specifications for trailers, okay? Good luck on your own trying to get them. So you bring together this forum and work those issues. So whether it's major policy issues that have uh, implications across the entire government, or whether it's those types of issues, how would you handle pandemic flu? We had a couple of threats that we had to go work out. That, that's down to, frankly, how do you uh, control the post office, or the, the postmen that deliver if you want to deliver drugs? This, has to, this requires a, a, a lot of coordination. On, and that's on the Homeland Security side. There's a crossover between the national security side. So if you have issues regarding terrorism that involves, let's say, Iraq or Afghanistan or things like that, principally, it's a national security issue. We're very fortunate because the national security and homeland security in the White House were seamless. That meant that on those types of issues from a national security standpoint, homeland security got a seat at the table to understand. We're very fortunate because the principal operating uh, person for the, for the National Security Council was Jane's husband, uh, a, uh, a great guy. A, 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 a three star. That's a so, power combo. So, uh, so I can tell you that on those types of <laughs> things, major homeland security issues, NSC that uh, kind of rolls over to it, uh, cyber. Cyber could not have been effectively implemented in any way if it wasn't for the Homeland Security Council. And the reason I say that is this. If you have to figure out how you come up with a budget that basically takes money from every one of the departments, you can only imagine what kind of a fist fight that is, where you give everybody a knife and then turn off the lights and see who's standing. <laughs> and if it really wasn't for the leadership that would make that happen, uh, there was no way to make it happen. So uh, that's why, from my standpoint, uh, it was absolutely indispensable. I, uh, some of the folks know that at the transition of the administration, uh, the uh, incoming president had made a decision, I don't know what actually happened early, uh, subsequently, but made a decision that they were going to uh, subsume the homeland security and the national security. So the individual that had been picked to be the national security advisor, uh, I went, second day uh, of the administration, I go down to see him, and I, and I tell him, I said, look, you don't know me from a hole in a wall, this is homeland security, I said, but I need you 
to implement some sort of a, a homeland security process. So great guy. Hey, look, I don't understand anything about that stuff. You know, I chased terrorists. I said, well, that's great, but you got to worry about this too. So I became very concerned, and I don't know what happened later, but ultimately not having that, that, that policy-making apparatus of coordination, interagency coordination, was absolutely essential to doing the mission. Paul, so HSC, if you could wave that magic wand, you would have that there day in, day out. Yeah, yeah, it, it was absolutely essential. And we were very fortunate because the secretary worked very closely with the, uh, uh, the head of the HSC. I worked very closely with the deputy, as I know Michael did. Elaine, I think you have a little bit of a different perspective on this. And then Jane and Ali, I want you to sort of weigh in since it, it, that's when the change occurred. But. I mean, I do think a lot of it is person dependent rather than organizationally dependent. I did see some benefits of having the NSC and HSC uh, co-joined, if you will. And one of the biggest benefits I saw was in developing the national security strategy. I think it was dependent on the fact that H.R. McMaster was running the NSC, you had Secretary Mattis, uh, Dan Coates, and Intel, and um, people that brought those years of experience simil similar to Paul and others. Um, but what I saw was DHS being more respected um, than, um, than, than in previous years. And it was because the traditional or legacy NSC type folks were understanding the capabilities and the authorities that DHS can bring to the national security table. So as an example, trade, the authorities that DHS has and the ability to, to generate revenue for our country on trade infractions and enforce the, the trade policy of this administration was huge. And so I saw the commingling of the two really rise the stature of Homeland Security and, and gain that understanding. But again, it was because those people were open um, to, to seeing that. The second piece that I think there was a benefit is that I think cyber and the speed of movement of goods and, and, and people has really commingled Homeland and National Security a little bit more than maybe in, in legacy days. The, the fact that much of DOD's activities is really the away game of Homeland Security. Um, like, like Paul said, the, the, do we, or, or I think it was Jane, do we know if the terrorists are there or here and how are we addressing it? Um, the, the fueling of um, you know, using drug sales to fuel terrorist organization. There is a commingling and I think that what we have to do is we have to find the optimum point is that they are not the same, but how do we deal with that ne nexus most effectively to bring both our national security and our homeland security capabilities together to the fight? So people matter. People matter. It, I, I would really echo that. People matter a lot. Um, I mean, I have a pet peeve. You know, people call it the NSC. It's the NSC staff. Yeah. Um, I, you know, was I was trained. I was trained at the at, at the NSC staff under Brent Scowcroft, and I am an unapologetic Scowcroft acolyte on this point. Hmm. Um, we are the help at the NSC staff. Um, you're not the boss of me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but and but that was an important and this transition. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an important for me. That was an important component because I had served at the NSC staff. Um, you know, under Scowcroft, the NSC staff was never more than 50 or 52 people ever. Um, and, and when the Obama administration came in, um, five of us were deputies, uh, had become deputies. I mean, so though there was an enormous affiliation personally. I mean, every one of us has mentioned it, and it matters a lot. Relationships matter a lot. Um, and the continual engagement on issues, you, you know, there was no sort of dog-sniffing exercise at the beginning of the Obama administration, yeah. like, who are you? You know, where have you been? You know, what do you know? <laughs> there was none of that. I mean, because people, I mean, they were really, as, as Paul said, came immediately in and ready to work. And as Michael said, if you asked for help, they gave it. And they were literally a, a phone call away. I, I guess I would say, you know, and by the way, thanks for handing me that knife. <laughs> Paul walked out of the dark room, hands me the <laughs> knife and says, good luck with that. Um, you know, because there was an interagency struggle, particularly on cybersecurity, uh, yeah. for for my whole for my whole tenure. You know, and and how we sorted out how do we move these assets into gr much greater collaboration, 
And I think, as you've seen over the course of time, there was a maturation. There was a maturation of mission performance, a maturation of mission understanding in the, in the interagency process that was essential. But to Paul's point, um, aside from the fact that I think the NSC has become overly large over the course of time, overly operational, um, which was completely antithetical to the, to the findings of the Tower Commission right after Iran-Contra, um, and, and where the whole existence of the NSC staff and that function was really yep. you know, in the balance. Mm -hmm. uh, we need the White House and the NSC staff to provide that coordinating function to bring everybody together. Small example, you know, when you're dealing uh, with the traveling public, right? Um, I was given the mission of negotiating the PNR, the passenger name record data sharing agreement with the European Union. It took us two years, it took us two years. Um, and, and there was at the beginning some complaint, why is Homeland Security doing this? I said, how many, you know, in DOD, how much of the American public do you interface with every single day? Department of Homeland Security, five to seven million people every single day directly hmm. come in contact with the department. DOD, you, intelligence community, we don't want to know. We do want to know, actually. <laughs> we do want to know. Right? They don't always know. Right? The, the State other Department, people none of these other security with. agencies have that kind of direct interface with the American public and similarly, if you had asked us, we could have told you a lot that none of the European countries are managing their immigration problem very well. We could told you a lot about how Brussels is beginning to overreach and that will have consequences. Can you say Brexit? And we could told you, have told you a lot about Theresa May because we interacted with her when she was Home Secretary yeah. all yeah. the time. Yeah. So Homeland Security does not substitute for national security, but it is an imp important component part and you've seen that maturation over these 19 years of the department's existence. Well, that's awesome. Does anyone want to weigh in? Just to, very I briefly, mean, if I may, uh, I think it all boils down to people. Um, and I know that the paradigm is that structures are built so that there is less dependency on people and the structures uh, uh, provide pillars of organization. But I think one can have the best structures and if the people aren't working well together, it's just not gonna work. We, um, uh, we had, an, uh, I, I thought, an extraordinary integration of national security and homeland security uh, efforts, and I think that was largely attributable uh, to the people uh, in the White House, uh, Susan Rice on one hand and Lisa Monaco uh, on the other. I do think it all boils down to people. You know, I want to pick up on that thread, because I, I mean, all too often in Washington, people look at the world through their boxes and org charts, not necessarily as the world is, and then figure out the boxes and org charts to get, get us there. And, and uh, Secretary Jackson, I think you brought this up. Let, let's talk about some of the career civil servants. I, I mean, you've got pe women and men working day in, day out on a, a very tough mission tends to be defined by a handful of things, good or bad, that are out uh, in the press at that time. I, I would like to talk about sort of the civil servant, because everyone here was in a very senior political position, but you know what? Everyone here was a civil servant first. All of you. Except, so, except well, even, but. That's right, I was just, it's good for you, Jay. I was a coasty. I was a GS7. All right, all right. That's still civil service. But, uh, but, but let's, let's pull the thread on that question, because you brought it up, Michael. I, I think that uh, in many administrations, but blessedly not at DHS and its history, have found that it's hard to get the political people to understand adequately uh, that the career people are on their side. They're probably smarter than the political people uh, like me that came on board and needed to know so much and learn so much. So from my perspective, uh, you know, every meeting that we had was open to uh, career people because the, the problems of DHS entailed understanding what they could bring to the table and know. And if you, if you were a political appointee or, or a career person and you went out and you ratted off to the, the press about stuff that was going on, then you just didn't get invited back ever again. But, but I'm telling you, the, the reliability uh, performance of the career civil service was probably uh, better uh, uh, all up than was the political uh, appointees. So, so it's, uh, that's something that is just essential is, uh, is to learn. The, 
the good thing about everybody sitting at this table was they, they were either career uh, people in some way or another, or they already learned this lesson uh, before they hit DHS. And, uh, and so I think DHS was blessed. You know, you, you asked us, what were we worried about? We were worried about everything, uh, but uh, it, it wasn't like some sort of burden, oh, woe is me thing. It was a enter through the door each day with a light heart and know you're working with the most talented and uh, fantastic people you will ever meet with in your life. And uh, go away from the day knowing that you'll do more tomorrow, but you'll mess up some and, and, and fix it. So, uh, so I think the career civil service thing is, uh, is sort of uh, uh, something people just have to know and understand. And it takes some, some political appointees longer to, to learn that lesson than others. But There are so many issues to cover. I want to ask one more question and start with Admiral Loy and everyone else sort of jump in. But uh, the looking ahead component, and, and, and I'd be curious, is the department properly calibrated looking ahead and and I want everyone to jump on this but at 30 second you get the longest but at 30 <laughs> second but I, I also if there was one thing you could have done that you didn't if there was one uh, particular issue I'd be curious what that is no there's probably a whole lot of stuff left in the in basket that you just never get to because of as you just said tyranny the, of the tyranny of time and the press uh, press of time and the engagement of the day um, I, I think the, uh, the challenge of uh, the, uh, the, what was the question? The, the calibration, question. are we ready yeah. going yeah, forward? The, the whole notion there has to do with understanding the cycle of government in our country, the budget cycle on an annual and biannual basis, uh, the idea of being thoughtful enough to not only uh, be the recipient of that tyranny that finds its way into your in-basket on a daily basis, but actually be, uh, make an effort to find your way to be ahead of the game. So I have always been an advocate of um, strategic planning. And I was at the Department of Transportation when Michael and I worked a, a number of different things there for, uh, for Secretary Mineta and others. Uh, I remember when I was a student at the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, and uh, the guy that happened to be the president of the National Defense University at the time, he had been the strategic planner for the chief of staff of the Air Force. He was an Air Force general, and he had been the strategic planner for the chief of staff of the Air Force. And I, I remember he gave a presentation to everybody, the whole student body, and I was intrigued enough with a couple of the elements that I heard that I asked him, if I could come in and shoot the breeze with him one, one day, and he said, sure. And so uh, <clears throat> he said his job when he was the strategic planner for the chief of staff of the Air Force, he had a small team, maybe 12 or 15 people, and they on a monthly basis had two hours with the chief of staff of the Air Force. He was supposed to bring three to five sort of wild and crazy ideas to roll onto the table of the chief of staff of the Air Force. He said, Nine times out of ten, I could, I could hear my ideas going into the round file as I left the room. <laughs> but every once in a while, there was the one, and he said, one day we chatted with the chief of staff about, wouldn't it be cool if we could find a way to, to, to have uh, airplanes you couldn't see on radar? Hmm. Think about that for a moment. And think about now with Changed. you know B2s and F117s and everything else. We've got an awful lot of airplanes that are very difficult to see on radar. So th the notion of a strategic thought that is part of that annual cycle of budgetary uh, work that is going to keep going on. That that thing's going to keep spinning and spinning and spinning. How do you insert that strategic notion? into the wherewithal to get accomplished the mission set that you're responsible for. Uh, so in, a, in, in terms of your look forward notion, I would like to think that ideas that Michael and I planted initially, uh, the other word that I would ask you as an audience to think about over what you've heard here from the panel is the evolutionary nature of what was planted as a seed and became harvested as a better idea and a better actual 
uh, uh, capability or functionality over time because none of the five or six people sitting here at this table, we would like to think that we had something to do with driving those notions over time. But going back to that workforce notion, the, the idea of the combination of political dri drive uh, and, and uh, civil service capability, when you have the bridge built to the private sector that enables all of that to come together, you have put together something really, really special. Uh, and that would be my hope for the, for the one idea to take away going forward is to enrich that bridge to the private sector that you could keep great ideas coming into that inbox. Yeah, you gotta sort the wheat from the chaff, no doubt about that on a daily basis. Uh, but at the other end of the day, the country benefits when, the, when coordination or mandated coordination becomes voluntary collaboration at the other end of the day. Uh, and I would like to think this evolutionary process has this getting closer to that point day after day after day. Admiral, I, I'm so happy you underscored that. And as a former commandant of the Coast Guard, an appreciation for strategic planning and, and the role uh, in policy and planning, actually, for that matter. You know, and not to throw another favorite quote, but then General Eisenhower, one of my favorite yeah. quotes was, in preparation for battle, I've often found plans to be useless, but planning to be indispensable. Yeah. And there was a time when we had a pandemic of plans. We, we had a plan for everything. We were just drowning in it. But that strategic planning component, which I think only DOD, maybe State Department, gets right. I would love to see that defined become at the stronger, office of the secretary. Yeah, Lightning round on what you wish you could have done if you want to touch that, or are we calibrated looking into 2020? So, so uh, I'll just say one thing about you, you got to coordinate with people. Uh, I'm going to say something nice about the Congress. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love Congress. So. We, uh, we talked about earlier that we got things done in, in the government uh, at the deputies level by having personal relationships with those deputies. And I used to do the circuit and go around and see people before a Homeland Security Council meeting, and we'd yep. have telephone calls. We'd, yep. we'd say, I I'm going to have to oppose this, and you know, we'd, <laughs> wor we'd work that through. I, I usually knew it. the vote of everybody in the room before I walked through the door, and hopefully we were, we were on the same page or else we were going to have to sit down and wor worry More through why we weren't on the same page. Yeah. So that, that's one thing that you can, you really can get so much done with personal relations. Then, People, Congress. people, people. I've yeah, heard that yeah, about The same yeah. thing with Congress. You know, we had a lot of fights with Congress. We're, DHS still does. But these are men and women uh, who, who in, in their own way come to town to try to uh, serve the American public. And you've got to help yourself get in their brains as well. So Chertoff and I used to go to uh, see the chairman and, and key members of each of our committees uh, on a routine basis and just, you know, sometimes we get yelled at, sometimes we'd help them understand where we were and, you know, we'd come to an agreement on things. Sometimes we'd walk away and not know uh, what, what, what to do about it, but we kept talking. And uh, I, I, I came to respect and, and to at least want to engage with uh, a, a, a remarkably broad sector of congressional people. I'll just tell one story about how that ends. Quick story. Got a call uh, because a congressional affairs person says, you got to talk to Senator X. Senator X wants this. Uh, and, uh, you know, you got to, would you take this call? Senator called. I said, look, I'll make this easy at the start. I know what you're calling about. I think you're wrong. But if you uh, aren't in agreement with me after, after five minutes, I'll do whatever you want. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll take your thing. So now you want to hear why I think you're wrong. And this senator said, I've never had a call like this before. <laughs> and, and I said, well, do you want to hang up now and get your yes? And, and they said, no, let's talk. And then at the end of the five minutes, they said, I'm going to have to think about this one. Got a call back from the senator the next day and said, you were right. I was wrong. Go wow. ahead. Forget this. Uh, so sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. But you awesome. got to just keep staying but you in the game. you got to engage. Yeah. Lightning round. So. Um, the, uh, uh, I, sh I should say there really are uh, very favorable 
uh, senators and congressmen who are really bipartisan, like uh, in Homeland Security. And uh, I, I, I would do the same thing that uh, Michael did with the secretary. We would meet every month uh, with, uh, in some cases, it was just the leaders. In some cases, it was, frankly, with the Homeland Security Committee uh, as, a, as an aggregate group and an informal uh, discussion. One of the things I wish I could have done better, frankly, or had more success, success with, was where I, I picked up uh, with what Michael was trying to do with the budget. Nobody wants to talk about the budget, but the fact of the matter is the, con the department runs on the budget. And you have to think about the fact, this is the big difference between the Department of Defense and the, uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I, don't, I think the actual budget numbers today in terms of the, the but after you take away fees and things like that, it's about $49, $50, $50 billion. Everyone has the hand. Oh, they have the hand out. Okay, so if you take a look at the, 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 the 230 or 240,000 people, uh, it's like the Army, which is a standing army. So a big part of the budget goes to take care of, of the people, and that's fixed, okay? Then you throw in a couple of billion here for uh, disaster relief, a couple of billion here for uh, grants. Uh, and uh, the flood program, uh, they talk about rent and things like that, and automobiles, and you're up about 60% of the budget, 65% of the budget. What does that mean? That means you have very little discretionary money. So one of the things Michael did was um, a famous meeting where you and I went with our CFO to talk to the head of OMB about, hey, wh why, why can't you treat us a little different than the rest of the department? And the poor uh, CFO at the time, who happens to be now the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the head of OMB <laughs> just, just beat the living crap out of him. Oh, yeah, always. Now, he wouldn't touch Michael, he, he wouldn't, wouldn't touch me. And uh, the problem is this, if you take a look at the infrastructure, of the department, it, 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 it is woefully uh, inadequate. I mean, there's uh, CBP uh, Border Patrol stations that look like, you know, 1950s uh, cowboy movie of the uh, the Pony Express. I mean, uh, there's uh, a woeful Secret Service's uh, IT uh, was uh, basically 20 years old. This takes money. This takes infrastructure. And the fact of the matter is. Uh, I, I personally wish I could have done more to increase the amount of non-discretionary funding because it was really uh, desperately needed. Secretary. I won't go into the, the business about SANEs, but you have to understand that um, one of the things Michael, uh, uh, I inherited from Michael was the uh, playing the Don Quixote uh, charging that windmill to get SANEs, okay? And I wish, frankly, that's the second thing, because as uh, uh, Elaine points out, St. Eve's was absolutely indispensable. You have to understand, I testified, I don't know how many times, considering, and it, it's in testimony, calling that place up in Nebraska Avenue a dump. And, uh, and, um, and it was a dump. And if, 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 if you understood how little support there really was whether it's from the Department of Interior and the Garden, you know, the Parkway Police, whether it was the veterans of the, was it the Confederate uh, that have a Civil War cemetery on the grounds, all these other crazies that came up. Do you feel strongly about this book? And, <laughs> and, and Paul, we gotta, we gotta yeah. make sure so, so the fact of the matter is, if we could have gotten more money and gotten more of that done much earlier, then it would have radically uh, affected the impact. Okay. And, and, and not to break my own rule, but uh, and Sec Secretary Lou, when you came in, one of the thoughts was to tie the QHSR with the bottom-up review to get to that calibration of budget. But I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Big thing you wish you did and, uh, um, and uh, looking forward. Yeah, I, th I think um, uh, the big thing I, I, I wish I had, had done a better job of is getting people to stop ridiculing the staff of the Homeland Security Department. Um, it's outrageous to me. Here, here. Uh, these men and women um, work their hearts out every single day. You know, I was in the Army. I went into the Army in the 70s. And I remember what it was like uh, at the end of Vietnam and what it was like to be someone wearing a uniform, wearing a uniform overseas. Uh, I know what it was like. 
And I've lived through that again, the way, the way people talk about the men and women in the Department of Homeland <coughs> Security, who, as we used to say, are struggling with issues that are above the, whole, above hmm. the fold and under the gun every single day. Here, here. Um, and, and I wish I had done a better job, and I, I, I made a number of members of Congress mad at me because I would speak exactly in this way. It's outrageous. I'm not going to sit here and listen to you speak about the men and women who are, no one's trying to get it wrong, and people are trying to get it right. And I realize there are frustrations. We're all dealing with those frustrations. But the, the caliber of the men and women um, who are in public service, some of them in civil service, <laughs> um, but who, who show up to work every single day are extraordinary. I wish I had done better because I wish I had done better in explaining the tension that exists in the missions of Homeland Security. If you look at the border, yes, we have to keep out people and things that might be dangerous, but we also have to expedite legitimate trade and travel. These are missions that are a little bit in tension with each other and sometimes a lot in tension with each other, and it does come down to people. I mean, sure, there are other things, like we had 29 databases for you know, vetting. I wish we had made more progress in common vetting. I wish we had made more progress in common aviation uh, assets and things like that in terms of operating the department. I think we made enormous progress on the security of the American homeland. I yep. think it's fair to say that when we're getting on airplanes every day, we don't first and foremost think about, is someone going to blow this plane up? You don't think about that first and foremost, and that wasn't an accident. On 9-11, there were more than just the, the young men and women um, who put on military uniforms. There were men and women who put on other uniforms as well and serve in Homeland Security. Uh, and I, had wish, I wish I had done better by them. Thank you. Secretary Mayorkas. Um, so I would say I want to pick up on um, what Secretary Lutz said. Uh, it, it's unfortunate, I think, and destabilizing for the department now to have quite a number of leaders uh, who are in acting capacity for an extended period of time. I don't think that is uh, good for the department or good for the mission. I remain optimistic and quite confident because the torchbearers of the mission are, in fact, the career people. Secretary and uh, I will do what I uh, tend to do and jump to solutions. I agree with everything that was said. I think that to um, imp to continue to mature our homeland security, we each have to be accountable and get back to the basics. When I was in office, I looked daily at my oath uh, of office, my oath to the Constitution. And I also, uh, as, as Ellie and others know, teach uh, citizenship classes to people going through naturalization. And they have to know 100 questions. And I think every American citizen should reread those questions about the three branches of government, um, what the Constitution says about we the people, the rule of law, and some other fundamental principles, and get smart on the issues. And one of the things that's in three of the different questions of, of your responsibility as a citizen, and I think that, as several of my, uh, my colleagues have said, Homeland Security is each one of our business, both personal and in our, in our business lives, and, and we need to stand jointly. We have time for one or two very quick questions since we're already 10 minutes over. We'll start with Ross Ashley and then Sherry and then really quick, uh, Ross Ashley and then we'll go right here to John. So, uh, we'll, get, we'll try to get three in, but Ross, <laughs> wait for a mic. Wait for a mic and please identify yourself. Sorry, everybody alluded to it. And then uh, uh, Dr. Secretary Lou, you you mentioned something in your, your discussion that may make this even not the, right, not the right way to do it, but is there an opportunity or in the future to get to something similar to a PBBS system for DHS where we can eventually get to the point where we can say, uh, is it more important to get an ice cutter, uh, 1,000 new TSA screeners, 100 new Border Patrol agents, and how do we describe that? Because right now our budgetary process is catch as catch can, the President's budget, ends up bearing no reality in what comes out uh, of the Appropriations Committee. So, and Deputy Secretary Luke, given your comments on national security versus homeland security, is that even the right model to that type of budgeting system? So, and I know Deputy, Deputy Secretary Schneider, you probably have some uh, major opinions and, and, on that and, from your background as well. Yeah. Anyone want to jump in on that first? Yeah, uh, yeah no, first off, uh, again, I come from Defense Department. Uh, there's an Appropriations uh, Act and uh, bill, and then there's a, uh, a defense bill. And if the two don't align, guess what? The people go back to work and they uh, get it aligned. So things that are authorized are either uh, appro are appropriated or not. You have those things that are authorized but not appropriated. 
those things that are appropriated but not authorized. And guess what? They get reconciled. So you have a clear, and I believe that uh, from a defense standpoint, the uh, leadership of uh, the Congress takes those types of aspects in effect. The problem I wrestled with was you had, you, you had an Appropriations Act and you had all these other things, and I frequently was chastised by Congress, why aren't you doing this, why aren't you doing that? Answer, that's an unfunded requirement because that's not in the Appropriations Act. So if there's a way to model that, I believe that, Ross, I think, I think that would be a giant step forward. Anyone else want to jump in quickly? Just, add, just on the front end of what goes into the development of the authorizing legislation and the appropriations that follow from the Congress, uh, the robust nature of a joint requirements council uh, in the department to actually be uh, staffed appropriately and the resolution of the kind of examples that were rolled on the table there to be, to, to be dealt with, uh, if you can get, as I think, several of my colleagues down, this, down the row here worked pretty hard to develop the strength of a Joint Requirements Council as a part of the input to that annual budget cycle, uh, such that not only the modal administrations are offered the opportunity to have their piece on the table, but then the department has its opportunity to resolve those kind of issues on the way into the budget process, such that when it's actually going outside the department, off to OMB, off to the Hill, it, it sort of is a, a solid, uh, agreed upon departmental position. And in fairness to the department, not only DHS, but every, it seems to be continually and then continuing resolution too. Sure. So the whole process itself is pretty difficult. So we've got John and then we're gonna have Jeff in the, in the back there. Uh, John Weiler, Executive Director, IT Acquisition Advisory Council. You can guess where my question might go. Uh, DOD and Homeland Security share a common problem is the ability to uh, set up requirements, acquisitions and management of IT for its most critical missions. We fail at this about 80% of the time. I think this is going to be a problem going forward if we don't fix this because almost every mission is so dependent upon the effective use of IT, whether it's cyber or information sharing, cloud. I'd like your thoughts on how do we wrestle this beast. Great. Anyone want yeah, to jump I'll, I'll, in? I'll take, I'll and then a, I'll take a shot at that. So uh, one of the things you have to ask yourself the question is uh, uh, the government holds the head of Customs and Border Protection. Uh, who has about 70 plus thousand people responsible for uh, protection of the borders and the ports and things like that. The system today also holds him responsible for the IT. So do you really, is that the right mix or should it be more like the Department of Defense where the people that uh, basically fight the war are not the people that build the infrastructure? And so if you take a look at T say what I just said and multiply that by several hmm. agencies. Why, it's because of, if you take a look at, uh, a lot of the IT is interconnected, okay? Well, a lot of it's vetting systems, crew systems, things like that, the PNR that uh, Jane talked about. So why wouldn't you consider a different business model, have the operators go fight the war, the operational law enforcement, and have the people that worry about critical IT infrastructure basically design, develop, implement that, that, that infrastructure for the use for the warfighter. Personally, I think the system could use a different business model. Thank you. John, John, we've got one more, we're already 20 minutes over. We've got one last so question. I'm just gonna say back. I disagree, but let's hear the, the other question. <laughs> good, good, Jeff. Thank you very much for doing this. Jeff Selden, I cover national security for VOA. Just wondering from the threat perspective, has DHS been as flex flexible and as adaptable to react to those threats as you hoped, whether it's foreign terrorism like we saw in 9-11, now domestic terrorism, the cyber and disinformation campaigns, even immigration and, and climate change, and, and where does DHS in, in these areas need to get better? So maybe I'll take a, a, I'll take a shot at that one. Um, you know, I said earlier the difference between national security and homeland security is, is you know, on the one hand, you know, strategic, centralized, and top-driven. You cannot know all that needs knowing if you take purely a strategic, uh, centralized and top-driven approach to the problem. You have to take, you, you have to complement that with a transactional, decentralized and bottom-driven. Hmm. 
I mean, I, I mentioned one pathology of our intelligence uh, world, and it's not just, by the way, peculiar to us, it's peculiar worldwide, is that they think a, the harder a piece of information is to get, the more valuable it must be. There's another pathology, which says the higher up the source of that information, the more valuable it must be. That's just simply not true. Um, the, the men and women of this country know an enormous amount about what's happening. State and local law enforcement, you know, 700, 850,000 of them, they know an enormous amount about anomalous behavior and what's going on. They need to be working with us. So we need to be able to draw on all of those sources, but also provide them and meet them where they are um, in, in countering uh, this intelligence threat. But do it, you know, in, in the words, I think it was Justice Stevens, um, uh, in the Youngstown steel seizure case, who said, ours is a nation of laws, not of men. We submit to no rulers except under rules. And that comes when we're assembling information and intelligence about the threat and how to respond, because our job is to protect the American way of life. Here, here. One very quick last question. I'm from Italy. I'm doing an internship here at the Italian Embassy. And uh, I would like to know your opinion about how the EU is dealing with the migration flows after the terrorist attacks, and in particular thinking about its agencies, and also stressing out the point that our, our sea, the Mediterranean Sea, is very small. So we have this problem that people just leave from the African coastlines and arrive. So I would like to know your opinion very quickly, <laughs> of course. Anyone want to quickly jump in on that? <laughs> I think we'll let the Europeans speak for the Europeans. <laughs> Anyone else? We are out of time. We're over time. But before I let you go, I want to recognize Brian DeValence. This was his idea, one of our rock star senior fellows. So thank National you, Brian. And, and, and let me also thank. What, what an amazing group of leaders here. They, they all bleed red, white, and blue. And uh, as tough as this job is, I felt so much better that all of you were at the helm. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your service. And thanks for joining us.